Hi there, thanks for joining us today. Let me ask you a question. You know, as you look over the church in America today, or at the uh, moral, spiritual climate of our nation, are you tempted to despair? Do you feel like uh, we're being held back or limited in some way, uh, maybe because of coronavirus or because of restrictions that have been placed upon us? You know, does it get you upset? Well, in this week's message, I'm hoping to give you cause for great encouragement and rejoicing in spite of the obstacles that you may see. I want to give you a promise, right? It's a promise that we can have great confidence in. This is something that you can take to the bank, right? So if you want your life to count, and I think most of us do, then you can count on this. In fact, if you were a betting person, this is something you'd want to go all in on, right? Invest all your money, invest your whole life, because it cannot fail, right? Nothing can stop it. No uh, conniving of man, no scheme of the devil, no conspiracy, no COVID-19, nothing in heaven or hell can stop this from happening. And so if you will grab hold of this today, it will give you great cause for joy. Oh yeah, what is it? Okay, it's the promise that came out of the mouth of Jesus himself when he said this. He said, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. That's all the people groups of the world. And then he says, the end will come. Now the context there in Matthew 24 is when uh, Jesus is telling his disciples what to expect in the last days. The days between his ascension to heaven and his return. The days in which we're living today. He said that the church would be persecuted, that there would be deception, there'd be an increase of wickedness. Many would turn away from the faith and uh, betray and hate each other and the love of many would grow cold. Not very encouraging, right? And yet, in spite of all that, he says that the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. And in fact, in Revelation 5, we see a picture of the end in a song that all the heavenly beings are singing to Jesus where they sing, For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed your people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. Right? Now what this tells us is that there is nothing that can hinder the triumph of the gospel. Nothing can stop it. Jesus has already paid the ransom for God's people with his own blood. He's already made uh, the payment in advance for all of those who will be saved from all the nations. They will be with him. Right? When the end comes, they will reign with him in the new heavens and new earth. So whatever happens to our world, right? no matter how much we might despair of people, however uh, bleak it might seem at times, nothing Nothing can stop God's kingdom from coming. You can count on it. If you want to invest your life in something, then invest it in the advancement of the gospel because it cannot fail. And in fact, we see that promise beginning to be worked out in the book of Acts and right up to the present day. So let's just start now by reading a few verses from Acts chapter 8. And then I'm going to give you some encouragements from the present day, including a story of a South American tribe who actually heard uh, those heavenly beings singing. So, the book of Acts. Last week we heard about the murder of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, which you know, must have been such a shock to the church. But let's just read what happened next, because it unleashed a terrible, demonic persecution against them. This is what we read in Acts uh, 8 verse 1. It says, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. This a zealous young Pharisee called Saul, who seemed to have something to do with the murder of Stephen, now he set out to systematically destroy the church, no, no doubt with the backing of other Pharisees. And it wasn't you know, just that the Christians could no longer meet as a church and worship in public, they were actually having to leave the church, having to flee the city. Right? It must have felt like the church was being systematically dismantled. 
Very vivid language is used here. Saul going house to house, dragging men and women off to prison. I mean, imagine living through that. They must have wondered if the church would survive. But in the very next verse, this is what we read. It says, those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Right? They shared the good news about Jesus to everyone who would listen. And then as an example, in fact, they, we're told one of the stories of a man called Philip who had served alongside Stephen, where it says Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. And if you read on there in Acts 8, it says that he did it by healing the sick so that people uh, who had been paralyzed could walk again. Uh, those who had been afflicted by evil spirits were set free. And so it says there was great joy in that city. And many came to believe in Jesus. And then we're told that an angel directed Philip to leave the city and to take the desert road uh, to the middle of nowhere, really, uh, where he encountered an African man uh, riding on his chariot on his way home to Ethiopia, where he was an official in the royal court. And he was sitting there reading uh, the book of Isaiah, which gave Philip the opportunity to discuss it with him and to tell him about Jesus. And so he also came to faith and was baptized. You know, and we can only wonder whether his conversion led to the gospel spreading to Africa for the first time. Because we know from archaeology that churches were established in that region from a very early date. And of course today, there are more Christians in Africa than on any other continent in the world. And that was just one story of a man called Philip sharing Jesus with the people that he met. But you know, there were many other unnamed Christians, just ordinary believers like you and I, who got dispersed around the world because of that persecution. And so in Acts 11, uh, we're told this, it says, Now those who have been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed travelled as far as Phoenicia, uh, Cyprus and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, they went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So the gospel was now bearing fruit among different nationalities in the Greek-speaking world. And the church that got established there in Antioch became a major apostolic center for mission, because it was there that the apostle Paul got sent out from to spread the gospel all over the world. And of course, the apostle Paul, also known as Saul, was the very same man who had tried to stamp out Christianity and who had got converted while hunting down Christians when he encountered the risen Lord Jesus. So, I think, you know, one of the greatest uh, lessons here uh, in this story of Acts is the strange and surprising triumph of the gospel against all the odds. Uh, the theologian John Stott uh, made this comment about it. He said, what is plain is that the devil who lurks behind all persecution of the church overreached himself. His attack had the opposite effect to what he intended. Instead of smothering the gospel, persecution succeeded only in spreading it. Right? The gospel is like a forest fire that cannot be stamped out. You know, these days we're used to hearing reports, aren't we? Seeing them on the television of forest fires that seem uncontainable because there, there are hundreds of them. And as soon as you know, one is put out, another five spring up elsewhere. And, and then when the wind blows, it just spreads uncontrollably. And that's how the gospel has spread throughout history. Uh, throughout the history of the church, that you know, the triumph of the gospel has not been without opposition or hindrance. There will be persecution, deception, division, betrayal, and the increase of evil, and those whose love for God will grow cold. And yet, the triumph of the gospel is the fact that it succeeds in spite of all of that, and sometimes even because of it. You know, Many thousands of people have been martyred for their faith since Stephen. And yet it seems that, you know, when the enemy thinks he's kind of stamped one out, five more spring up. It's like Tertullian said, he was one of the uh, early church fathers in Africa. He said, the blood of the martyrs 
is the seed of the church. John and Betty first met at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago and then they met again quite unexpectedly in China where they'd gone as missionaries. They got married there in 1932 and had a daughter called Helen. She was three months old when the communist troops invaded the small city they were living in and they arrested John and Betty Stan. Local Christians pleaded for the foreigners' lives, but John and Betty were beheaded. Their daughter was found uh, two days later by a, a, a Christian Chinese pastor who took her home to care for her. And she eventually was taken back to the United States where she was raised by her aunt and uncle. You know, that story sent shockwaves across America and got a lot of publicity. But at the same time, you know, quite surprisingly, it inspired and motivated many young people to go overseas with the gospel uh, to take their place. Young people who wanted their lives to count for something. Later on, in 1949, when China came under communist rule, all the foreign missionaries were kicked out of the country. But then many of them ended up in Japan and in Southeast Asia, where they continued to share the good news of Jesus. In 1949, it's estimated that there were around 4 million Christians in China, but they were persecuted by the communists. Many were put in prison. Many lost their lives. Another massive wave of persecution happened during the Cultural Revolution. And in fact, many Christians outside of the country wondered if the church could possibly have survived, whether there were any Christians left in China. But after several years, news began to get out of a thriving underground church, where today it's estimated as many as 20,000 people are converting to Christ every day. And that by the year 2050, there will be as many as 250 million Christians in China. You cannot extinguish or hinder the gospel. Anyone who tries to will only help it to grow and spread. And of course, part of the reason for the gospel's triumph is that it's not being left to just man alone. As we've seen before, the book of Acts is about the acts of the risen Christ working through his church by the power of his spirit. Right? There is a supernatural aspect to the spread of the gospel where the wind of the spirit fans the flames. And that really came home to me when I read another story recently about a South American tribe in Ecuador the uh, Hurani tribe. Now, many of you listening will know of this tribe because they are the ones who killed five American missionaries in 1956. Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, and three others had made contact with this tribe, wanting to share the good news of Jesus with them. And they were encouraged by the progress they thought they were making until one day, tragically, they were speared to death on the sand bank of the river by about 10 Hurani warriors. You know, they knew the risk they were taking, but they were willing to lay down their lives for the sake of the gospel and in their love for Jesus and for this tribe. As Jim Elliot had famously said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. The amazing story of what followed and how many of that tribe became Christians has been well told by Elizabeth Elliot in books uh, such as Through the Gates of Splendor. But what I didn't realize is that it was only relatively recently that some of those uh, Horani tribe revealed what happened in the stillness that followed the murders. Nate Saint's son, Steve, wrote how one of the three uh, Horani women who watched the missionaries being killed told him afterwards she heard singing above the trees and saw what could only be described as angelic beings uh, along the ridge above the beach. And she'd never heard this kind of singing before until later on she heard a recording of a choir. Apparently, many of the tribes saw this bright multitude in the sky and felt scared because they knew this was something supernatural. But it drew them to God when they later got to hear the gospel. One day, there will be people from every nation, every tribe, every language who will join in with that heavenly song, worshipping Jesus. Today, more men and women are being persecuted for Jesus than at any other time in human history. And yet, 
the gospel is reaching more people today than ever before. In the year uh, 1900, there were just 50,000 Protestant believers in Latin America. Today, there are over 100 million. More Muslims have become Christians in the last 10 years than in the last 10 centuries. Christianity is growing at five times the rate of atheism. In fact, there are fewer atheists in the world today than there were in 1970. Right? Listen. Our God reigns. His gospel and his global mission will triumph. Right? Because he is the Lord over all. Lord over kings. Lord over governments. He is the Lord over all history. Lord over all natural disasters. Lord over all pandemics. Right? He will use them all to further his great purpose to have a people from every tribe, every nation, a kingdom of priests who will reign with him, reign with his son forever. Right? That is how it ends. That is why we do not need to fear. Right? The world is not going to end with the sun exploding or some giant meteor destroying our planet or some virus wiping out mankind. History ends with the triumph of the gospel. Right? This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come, said Jesus. That's his promise. Right? And then we will reign with him forever. So, what does this mean for us in our own situation? Three things, all right? Three things, just briefly. Number one, have confidence in the gospel. As we look across our spiritual landscape in our nation, we might be tempted to despair about the obstacles and the opposition we see. But that is the very soil that this gospel can prosper in. Let's not be ashamed of the gospel. Let's have confidence to identify with Jesus and tell people what he has done for us. Because there are many, many people all around us People we know who God is going to bring into his kingdom because Jesus has already paid for them with his blood. It's why we can have confidence that nothing we do for the Lord will be in vain. In fact, that's what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Uh, he said this, he said, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. Right? No good work is in vain. No prayer that we offer is in vain. No sermon preached is in vain. Not even this one, right? No letter of encouragement, uh, no act of service, no dollar given is in vain. No life laid down for the sake of the gospel is in vain. Nothing that we do for Jesus and for his great cause will be in vain because we have confidence in the gospel that his kingdom will triumph in the world. And so I pray, that in these days we'll all be motivated to abound in the work of the Lord, as Paul says there. Right? May our enthusiasm for the gospel be contagious. Secondly, keep our focus on Jesus. It's amazing that in the persecution that followed Stephen's death, you, know, you, you don't hear uh, of the Christians whining and complaining uh, or reacting with anger or hostility. They were certainly grieving. I mean, it says they mourned deeply for Stephen. And they endured great hardship, no longer being able to meet all together, many having to leave their homes. And yet there's no hint of self-pity or entitlement. Instead, wherever they went, they shared the good news of Jesus. They brought joy to the world because their focus was on him. Right? Like Jesus, they knew that they were pilgrims in this world, living with the certainty of his coming kingdom, understanding that the best is yet to come. Christians will never convince the world that the gospel is good news and that Jesus is worth living and dying for when all that we do is argue and complain. As Paul wrote to the Philippians, he said, it's not the grumblers and complainers who will shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. We may fear uh, having our civil or religious liberties taken from us, but as we've seen, you know, that will not hinder the gospel. I'm not saying we shouldn't fight for those things. I'm just saying we shouldn't react with despair or anger or complaining because the most important thing is not me, it's Jesus, right? It's the gospel. And if our focus is on him, then we can rejoice in even the most challenging circumstances and bring joy to those around us because we're totally secure in the knowledge that Jesus is Lord of all and his kingdom is unstoppable, right? So I pray that in these days, our focus will be fixed 
on Jesus. Thirdly, pray for revival. Pray for God to revive and purify his church in these days and bring about a spiritual awakening in our nation. Now all around us we're seeing the fulfillment of Jesus' words. Where there is deception, there's wickedness, the love of, for God has grown cold in many. The, you know, the gospel will prevail, but it's not through man alone. We need the Spirit of God. And so I pray that the Holy Spirit would ignite a flame in each of us, a, a holy passion for Jesus and his kingdom, and that the wind of the Spirit would fan that flame into a blaze that would then spread like an unstoppable wildfire across this land and across the world until that day when Jesus will be all in all. Amen? Listen, don't despair. Don't be afraid. Don't give up. Have confidence. Keep your focus on Jesus and pray, right? The best is yet to come. God bless you this week.